Welcome to The Chem Doctor, and uh, what I want to do in this video is lay the groundwork for uh, understanding uh, electron structure, which eventually leads to the quantum mechanical model of the atom, and uh, to electron configuration and orbital diagrams. I recently posted a video that's called Simulation of Electron Binding to a Proton, and I strongly recommend that the viewer uh, watch that video because what what you need to wrap your mind around is the idea that an electron with with a negative charge will attach it, itself to the surface of a proton or to the surface of, of an atom by virtue of the fact that it's attracted to the positive charge of uh, the nucleus of that atom which has protons that carry positive charges. Um, this is an important concept because basically uh, when you read in a textbook about uh, the, the chemistry surrounding this, the, the authors are going to use the term electrostatic force, which on the surface of it can be a fairly abstract um, term to understand or concept to understand. And uh, my video, Simulation of an Electron Binding to a Proton, gives you a visual at least to think about. And in that video, I use two magnets to demonstrate uh, that relationship. I can do that because magnetic force of attraction mimics fairly well the electrical force of attraction between two oppositely charged particles. So um, let's go ahead and get down to it. And where I want to end with this presentation is, is my version of uh, the Bohr model. So th the fundamental idea here is that you've got a, pro a proton or protons in the nucleus of an atom. If we're talking about hydrogen, then there's only going to be one proton, and the proton carries a, a, a positive charge. If we're talking about any other atom on the periodic table besides hydrogen, then there's going to be more nuclear charge than just plus one. But the basic idea is that you've got this proton, and the electron is attracted to that proton. Both the proton and the electron carry the same magnitude in charge but opposite in terms of the fields so that, the, that there is a mutual attraction between the two particles. It's good to have an image of this in your mind like the one that I'm drawing here. So the, the electron, if it's in close proximity to an atom that has protons in it, the electron is going to stick to the surface of that particular atom. That's the basic idea here. Now, the electrostatic force concept uh, has to do with the fact that these two particles have mutual attraction. Oftentimes, authors and teachers are also going to talk about the potential energy of that interaction. And potential energy in itself is a concept which can be fairly abstract and, and may or may not be going over your head. So what I want to do right now to talk about to, to further enhance this idea of electrostatic force and potential energy is to, is to talk about those two ideas from the point of view of a mechanical model first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw basically a cliff system here and I'm going to use a mechanical model. So we have a cliff and at the base of the cliff we have a rock. All right, and we can say that the rock is about uh, is about two pounds, which means it's somewhere around one kilogram. All right, and we'll say up to the first ledge that's 20 feet. All right, and the second ledge here we'll say is about five feet. So it's about five feet from the, from the first ledge to, to the top of the cliff, the very top of the cliff. All right, and it's about 20 feet from the ground level up to, uh, up to this first ledge. Now, you can, you can relate that if I want to move this rock to the first ledge and put it here, that it's going to require energy to do that. Say that you're standing at the base of a cliff and you're about to go rock climbing for the first time. The only way that you're going to be able to get this rock from here to this position here is by taking the rock, putting it in your pack, and then climbing up the cliff. All right, and climbing up the cliff is, here's my pack. We'll say here's the rock, all right? And climbing up this cliff is going to be hard. In any place here, if you let go, what's going to end up happening is you're going to be right back down here 
on the ground level. You're going to fall back down to this level. So in essence, what I'm going to argue to you is that this rock only has the choice of three places in my diagram. It can be located at the ground level where it is here. It can be located on this ledge or it can be located on this ledge. And it cannot be between the, between the ledges because if the rock tries to come to settle on the side of the cliff, it's just going to fall back down. All right, and if if we start out on this ledge that's part way up at 20 feet, and we try to stop part way up, it's going to fall back down to this ledge. So, what I'm going to argue here is that this rock only has certain energy options. the The energy option here at the first ledge, we can cal actually calculate its potential energy, which I'm going to um, abbreviate PE as m g h. So the M is the mass, all right? The G is the gravitational potential, and, or excuse me, the gravitational acceleration due to gravity, just abbreviate it that way, and H is the height at which we find this ledge above where this rock is. Now this equation um, in itself is not that important to us this morning. I just put it here to emphasize the fact that we actually can calculate the potential energy. So what does this mean? We've moved the rock up to this ledge that's 20 feet above where we started, and we say that the rock has a higher potential energy than it did when we started relative to the force of gravity, which is always operating on this object. All right, so it's at a higher potential energy. Now, if we, we remove the friction and we allow the rock to fall back down, we learn in basic physics classes that the energy that we gained moving the rock to this ledge is now going to be released as kinetic energy. All right, and if we allow the rock to continue on down until it reaches its original point again, all of the energy that was gained moving it to the ledge is going to be released when the rock reaches its original point once again. Another way to think about the higher potential energy is the fact that once we're on this ledge, in order to get it to the very top, if we're going to move it here, you can clearly see that will it will take less energy. We will burn less calories to move the rock from this position where we're starting at the 20-foot point to this position than it would, would be if we had to start all over again and bring the rock from the ground level here all the way to the very top ledge. All right, so every time we move this rock up to a new ledge, we've moved it further away from the starting point. It has higher potential energy. It will take less energy to remove that rock from its current position and move it to a new ledge. Now, if we, remo if we relate this to an electron, so I'm going to draw the same picture here, but now what I want to do is make this into an electronic model. So I'm going to put my proton here, and here's my electron. The electron is attracted to the proton by electrostatic force, so it's being held very tightly. For the sake of trying to understand this, I'm going to put footage on this, even though in reality this doesn't have any bearing at all, right? Because the, in, in, inside an atom, the electrons in their, in their energy states are not literally feet apart from the proton. But what I want to try and do is get the viewer to understand the concept of the force of attraction between the electron and the proton and the idea of energy. Because coming back to the mechanical uh, model over here, the force of attraction that's holding that rock on the ground or holding that rock on the ledge at 20 feet or holding that rock on the ledge at 5 feet is gravitation, the gravity of Earth pulling down on that rock. And, and by, the, by, the, by the way, you are an object too, so you are generating a gravitational force that's pulling up on the Earth. So in, in essence, when we look back at the electronic model, we see that, that the force of attraction here is electrostatic force. So we have the electron, the proton is pulling down on the electron. The uh, the electron is pulling up on the proton. There's a mutual force of attraction. For, for me to remove that electron and move it up to the ledge, I have to generate a force uh, 
pulling these two things apart that, that is greater than the force of attraction that's holding them together. So in order for me to move this electron to this ledge, I am going to have to burn energy to do it. Once the electron is here, if it moves back down again, similar to the mechanical model, this electron is going to release energy on its travels back down to its original position. So energy, energy will be released. Now, just like the mechanical model, the energy is conserved. What we gained moving the rock up to the ledge will be released in total as the rock moves back down. What the electron gained in moving it to this ledge will be released as we moved it back down. Now, in the case of the electron, instead of that energy being released as kinetic energy, the energy is going to be released uh, as light, as light energy. All right, now, if, if your teacher has demonstrated the flame test yet, if we had uh, a sample of sodium and we expose that sodium uh, to a flame, what you're going to see coming off, uh, let's see if I can get a better, uh, a better coloration of this. What you're going to see color, uh, coming off of this is going to be a very uh, brilliant yellow light. Not exactly this color, but that's what I've got on my palette right now. Maybe if I try to mix some orange into this, uh, maybe, that would, uh, maybe that would work a little bit better. But the main point being is that when you flame test the sodium, what you're seeing happen there is that it, the electrons are being moved to up to a higher ledge and when those electrons drop back down they're they're releasing the energy that was gained and that energy is coming off as light energy of actually specific wavelengths of light because in an atom if, if you look back at my uh, example here you can see that we're, we're elevating this electron from some kind of ground level, right? Just like where my rock is sitting on the ground, this electron is sitting on some kind of an energy platform in a sense of thinking, not in reality, but in a sense of thinking. And when we move that electron up to a new energy level, uh, that electron had to gain a specific amount of energy. When it comes back down, it's going to release that energy. When you look at, uh, let me let me change the color of that. When you look at the mathematical equations that express, uh, that show you how uh, energy is related to light. We can have the energy of a photon, right? The energy of light. And that is going to be equal to Planck's constant which is just a number times the speed of the light, which in a vacuum is also constant. All right, and we're going to assume that we're in a vacuum here, uh, divided by the wavelength of the light. So the idea here is that when you energize the sodium and you see that brilliant yellow light coming back out of the flame, which happens to be about 589 nanometers, all right, what that suggests, what that means, since we're getting a specific wavelength of light, is that that, that uh, particular electronic transition has a very specific energy. So coming back to, to the diagram to translate what I just said into English, we have an electron C that, that when we energized it with the flame is moved to a higher energy level. The electron can't exist anywhere between those two energy levels. To elevate the electron to this ledge, we had to put in a specific amount of energy. That's this idea here. When the electron tumbles back down, that energy is released as, as light. And we see the human perceives this brilliant yellow flame, which has a specific wavelength, which has, therefore, a specific energy. All right? And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this video. Thank you very much for watching. In the next video that I produce, what we're going to do is take this idea and we're going to extend it to the Bohr model for the atomic, for the electronic structure of hydrogen. And I'm going to represent that model in a different way than you see it in the textbooks. Uh, again, thank you for watching.